attempt two at the last part. <laughs> so here we are, guys, the last part of my top 100 favorite films of all time. Of course, this will be 10 to 1, and I'm just going to get started. Uh, number 10 I saw back in 1989 was my intro to the brilliant director of James Cameron, and I've always loved this film, and that is 1989's The Abyss. This is a fucking fantastic film. Um, the cast is uh, absolutely fantastic. You got Ed Harris, you got Mary Elizabeth Mastantonio, and you got Michael Bien, who was, who sh oh my god, he was creepy as hell. It has a great story, great visual effects. It seems like if I'm not talking about the movie too much, it's because I, I rambled too much in my first attempt. So, um, there we go. Number 10, The Abyss. To the point where I was just finished my review in number two, and I was like, no, I, I have to get it all done. Um, number nine, I saw around the same time I saw The Abyss, and made me absolutely fall in love with sharks. Doesn't really need an intro, and that, of course, is 1975's Jaws, directed by Steven Spielberg, starring Roy Scheider, uh, Richard Dreyfuss, and Robert Shaw. Unfortunately, Richard Dreyfuss is the only one of those three guys left. Um... The music in this, I think, really uh, contributed to the success of the film. Of course, it's by uh, John Williams, who is probably the, the god in the composing world for movies. It's a great story. Thank God they changed. I read the book, and I hated the book. So thank God they changed a lot of stuff, particularly the ending, because the ending in the book sucked. <laughs> so thank God for that. But yeah, I had an opposite reaction. I fell in love with sharks after this movie. I'm just weird. So there we go. Number nine, Steven Spielberg's Jaws. Number eight is one of the only films by this director I actually love. There's another one I like. I did not like the science fiction epic he did in 1968. I hated that film. But as for a certain horror film he did in 1980, I might give it another shot. I've given it a couple shots, but I find it so boring. And the director is Stanley Kubrick, and the movie in question at number eight is 1971's Clockwork Orange. Oh my! I was about 14 when I saw this, and I could see why it shocked the hell of a lot. Of, yeah, shocked the hell of a lot of people back in 1971. One of the the very first, or no, it's not Midnight Cowboy was, but this is one of the first uh, few X-rated films that got an Oscar nomination for Best Picture. Uh, Malcolm McDowell is absolutely fantastic in this and if I'm pretty sure he got an Oscar nomination I'm not a hundred percent sure but if he did he so deserved it if he was creepy and scary but like he is in a lot of his movies yeah, so I don't really know the other cast members I just kind of I don't want to say fixated but that's how I could only only word I can use is on Malcolm McDowell's character. I was like, fuck the rest of the cast. This guy basically is the movie. And I think a lot of us can agree. But one of my favorite scenes, the one I laugh at the most, is when he takes the two girls home, the, the threesome scene, and where it's sped up. I just laughed my ass off the first time I saw that. It's just so hysterical. Uh, so yeah, number eight, Clockwork Orange. Number seven is probably one of the most disturbing films ever made, and no, it's not a horror film, but it was so disturbing to a 13-year-old because I knew a little bit, I didn't know too much about World War II, but I did not know that this had happened. I think you already know what it is, and that, of course, is uh, 1993's Schindler's List, directed by Steven Spielberg, who absolutely, positively deserved his Oscar for this. Um, it's a very disturbing movie. Like, I have owned. Um, like, how disturbing is it? We'll put it this way. In the past 18 years since this movie was released, I've seen it a grand total of three times. When I was 13, second time when I was 18, and the third time is when the DVD came out. And that was back in, in 2003. So, the cast is fantastic. Liam Neeson, my god, he was, he was great as um, Oscar Schindler. Um, ben Kingsley was also fantastic. But the one who stood out to me was, of course, Ray Fiennes, who I, and probably a lot of other people, literally wanted to kill. He was so believable and perfect as that character that I, I wanted to find him and I wanted to kill him. Um, of course, I don't want to now, but it took me a long time to get over that. Um, 
but yeah, th this was such an eye opener to a 13 year old. Like, um, I remember at the last 45 minutes just crying my eyes out. I couldn't stop. I, I literally was hysterical. Um, but if you, like, if I said, if you don't know too much about World War II and this is kind of your intro to it, and then you find out that this stuff actually happened, then of course you'd be a, a little bit disturbed by it. Uh, thank God it was in black and white because I think if he, Spielberg would have done this in color, I don't. Um, I think it would have gotten an NC-17 rating. I'm pretty sure it would have. But the black it works so much better in black and white. Um, but yeah, absolutely fantastic. So there we go, number seven Schindler's List. And number six, ironically, is another Spielberg World War II movie and doesn't need another intro, and that is Saving Private Ryan. And he won the Oscar for this, which was fantastic, but of course it didn't win Best Picture. How the hell it lost to Shakespeare in Love, I don't know. But again, absolutely fantastic movie. The cast is great. You got Tom Hanks, you got Matt Damon, you got Edward Burns, you got, um, um, Tom Sizemore, you got a whole bunch of people, a whole bunch of cameos, and it works. Uh, there's one particular scene that always stood out to me, and it's that poor son of a bitch on the beach who had his arm blown off, and he's looking through the the dead body, he's trying to find his arm. I That scene always stood out to me. Um, but it's a fantastic movie. I was lucky enough to see this in the theater. So, yeah. so there we go, number six, Saving Private Ryan. Number five is arguably one of the absolute best sequels of all time. And like I said with Alien, direct, of course you get uh, James Cameron to direct the sequel, it's going to kick ass. That, of course, is 1991's Terminator 2 Judgment Day. How is, I'm changing sides, <laughs> I don't know why. Um, what can you say? This movie is now 20 years old and it still holds up. Um, it's just a fantastic sci-fi action movie. Um, uh, kind of redefined CGI, or it was the start of the CGI era. Um, the cast is fantastic, of course, Arnie as the Terminator, but a good Terminator. Uh, Linda Hamilton, Edward Furlong as John Connor, this was his very first movie. And of course, like, uh, I think we can all agree, the person that stood out the most was Robert Patrick as the T-1000, and he was so good. Unfortunately, the poor bugger was typecast almost half of his career until he did the X-Files, where I, I think a lot of people stopped thinking of him as the T-1000. Um, yeah, the special effects are great. Everything about this is great. And I could go on and on about this. Maybe. So there we go, number five, Terminator 2 Judgment Day. Number uh, four, at the time I saw this in the theater, I, I expected it to be good. I just didn't expect it to be this great. Um, it, it, it just was, especially in the theater, three times. That is 2000's Gladiator, directed by Ridley Scott, starring Russell Crowe, who so deserved his Oscar for this. Uh, though, it was kind of hard who to pick, him or Tom Hanks, for Castaway. That, it was just like, it was like that good. Um, also, very disturbing, disturbing, very deserving of its best picture win. Sorry guys, I hated Traffic. I thought that was an absolute piece of shit movie. I'm still pissed off they picked him, that director, over Ridley Scott. I'm still mad about that. Um, the action scenes in this were phenomenal in the theater. I saw this three times in the theater, and the last time was exactly one week before it was supposed to come out on DVD and video. Um, the supporting cast is fantastic. You got Joaquin Phoenix, who... Who and sometimes his character seems so much of a pussy, but also he was very sinister. So you have Connie Nielsen, Nielsen, who is very good. This was also very much my intro to uh, Oliver Reed and Richard Harris, who unfortunately both actors are no longer with us. Oliver Reed passed away before the filming of this ended. Um, but yeah, and the music by Hans Zimmer was one of my favorite scores of the last decade. So. And, and uh, the moment where I thought this was going to be great is after you see the hand go through the wheat and they have that close-up of Russell Crowe's face. And I just, where he's just like this and then he slowly looks up and I smiled and I turned to my parents and I said, this is going to be a great fucking movie. Luckily I was right. There we go, number four, Gladiator. 
Number three, I am going to get so much, maybe a little bit of flack for, but I don't understand why everybody called this a cult movie. How the hell does the um, movie uh, that won 11 Oscars and until 2009 was the highest grossing film of all time? That, of course, is 1997's Titanic, directed by James Cameron, uh, who so deserved the Oscar for this. Um, it is a fantastic movie. I don't care what anybody says. A lot of people think it was because I was a chick, and I was one of the people who saw this a lot. Not a lot, I saw it three times. But I always loved this. Um, maybe it is because I, I am not a romantic. I like I do have romantic movies in my collection, but I don't have to. I don't have to define my life, um, like most chicks do <laughs> by romantic films. But I was always I was so drawn to the story, the or the love story in this. And um, I've been a fan of Leo at that time for seven years. Now it is over 21 years. And him and Kate Winslet. Uh, who I think is one of the most beautiful women in the world, their chemistry together was just so fantastic. Um, and the supporting cast is great, particularly Billy Zane, who always is always great as the bad guy. Um, the music by James Horner is absolutely fantastic. Um, I know a lot of people are really sick and tired of that song, but I always enjoyed the song, which is uh, My Heart Will Go On by Celine Dion. Um, and this was great to see in the theater. Um, I, mean, I can't really say too much about it. Uh, so there we go. Number three, Titanic. Number one, I saw back in 1992 uh, because I had just um, I had just watched Alfred Hitchcock's North by Northwest, and I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And my parents knew I was becoming quite the horror movie fanatic and thought, well, what would she think of this? I thought it was actually quite boring until they got the mo to the motel. And had that fantastic shower scene that made me take a bath for two months. And of course, I'm talking about 1960s Psycho, directed by Alfred Hitchcock, of course. This scared the hell out of a lot of people back in 1960. We all know this story. And of course, Anthony Perkins was fan absolutely phenomenal as Norman Bates. So phenomenal, in fact, that he unfortunately was typecast for the rest of his career. Basically, until 1960, until the, when he passed away back in 1992. Um, but that shows you what a great actor he was if he could just scare the hell out of you playing the boy next door who's <laughs> and that uh, Janet Lee was fantastic Vera Miles, John Gavin everybody in this movie was fantastic and it's got one of the best film scores of all time done by Bernard Herrmann especially during the shower scene which it just makes you want to go like that um, but we all know the story so I don't really have to go into it so there we go, number two, Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho. So, we're finally at number one. I think you all know what it is because I've stated that this is my absolute favorite film of all time. I got to see it back in the theater back in 1982, um, when I was still, I was still a baby basically, I was only a year and a half old, and I had the absolute pleasure of seeing it 20 years later in the theater. That, of course, is Steven Spielberg's E.T., the extraterrestrial. I can, oh my god. I always get made fun of for the fact that I am such a, I hate to say it, but it's true, I am kind of a dark person with some of the movies I watch, but, you know, I've always had this, the biggest soft spot for this movie. Well, I wouldn't call it a soft spot, but you, you guys know what I mean. I've always loved this. It's a great, great story. Um... It, um, got a great cast with D. Wallace, Drew Barrymore, Henry Thomas, Robert McLaughton, I think is his name. Um, and you have an another fantastic score by John Williams. You have great scenes, especially the bike over the moon. And it doesn't matter how many times I've seen this in the past, fuck, th almost 30 years now. I always cry at the ending. Um, it's a fantastic movie, and I, a lot of people thought I was insane that I paid $75 for this. Well, I would have spent $200 for this, because that's how much I love E.T. So, there we go. Number one favorite film of all time, E.T. Well, guys, that's it. I hope you enjoyed 
my top 100 favorite films list. I know there's some odd ones, but like I said, it's my list. Uh, sorry, it took me so damn long to do it. Um, you know, just couldn't get the oomph to do the videos half the time. But um, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I have one more video today. That, of course, is my end of the month Doctor Who update. So until that video, I shall talk to you guys later. Bye.